Okay. So I was talking about this 1893 Volcker report, uh, and he was um, a scientist from the Royal Agricultural Society of England. Was sent to India uh, to survey the place and. Uh, Uh, give his uh, suggestions on improving indian agriculture so he gives uh, it's a very big report and he says a lot of very interesting things and more than anything else he gives a very detailed descriptions of the airy system this interlinked tanks the columns the dug wells the river canals and he also talks about the water lifting devices you know and in fact he says that uh, after having uh, traveled the area uh, he felt that he was he was not very impressed by the uh, tank irrigated uh, farming because he said there's a lot of wastage of water uh, and he said the canal system has its own uh, limitations but he said i am very impressed by the uh, open wells the farms that are irrigated by the open wells they are maintained scrupulously clean from weeds uh, the crops grow in a perfect way and uh, there is no excess of water and the reason is because people had to work to lift the water so you have you probably seen those seesaw uh, system that's a unique feature of tamil nadu uh, uh, traditional agriculture they had the system of a, you know so there would be one man or two men standing and if they move this side the water would lift up if they moved that side it would go down and there would be another person drawing the water from the container into the distribution canals to the field distribution things to the field so because they have to do that work or because it has to be done by bullocks uh, there is no wastage of water and he praises very much and he, he he doesn't he says that this is fantastic so at the end of it uh, he his conclusion he was supposed to make a small report but he made a 400 page report and at the end he says i do not share the opinions that agriculture uh, being as a whole indian agriculture is as a whole primitive and backward but i believe that in many parts there is little or nothing that can be improved so at the same time so now we have to ask ourselves so then what happened you know so at the same time i want to recall a few for maybe 5 10 minutes uh, what was what else was happening uh, in india and we have to go back to uh, again rewind to history a bit at the end of the 1600s the french came to pondicherry and uh, in uh, 1703 uh, there is a clear uh, evidence i mean it's uh, it's in one of the gazetteers again that uh, in 1703 the village of kala pet uh, was bought by francois martin the first french governor of pondi and uh, it was bought together with all the forests that surround it and the forests ar- surrounding kala pet were famous for their mature teak and rosewood and that was bought so that the teak and rosewood from the kala pet forest could be used to build the city of pondicherry and it's also documented uh, that uh, within 10 years of cutting the forests for building the city of pondicherry the canyons of kala pet started forming so this probably the utility area is also in the same region uh, that's probably one of the effects then you know that the british and the french were very well established all the all the colonials were established the british in fort st david uh, fort st george in madras and fort st david in kadlur the french were here the danish were in trankebar which is called tarangambadi and the portuguese had come long back uh, uh, to sentom which is part of madras now um, so all of the all this colonial activity was very uh, you know brisk and all the i mean the trade the trade in textiles at that time there were also many crops that were uh, introduced like uh, indigo tobacco and peanuts these were cash crops which were not part of the food system but they were introduced because they had a market value um there was also timber trade with uh, teak and ebony 
and ebony we know is one of the prized goods from this place and i have to verify this but i was told that the uh, the that a class of artisans in france called the ebonists they specialized in working uh, with ebony wood and uh, most of it probably came from these areas the tdf areas or uh, from africa because the trade was so brisk there were uh, there were a lot of people skilled in boat building and i i told you i came across this manual of boat building and uh, they uh, there were there were different kinds of boats that, that were used for different merchandise for international trade with different merchandise so there were specialized boats made for transporting the uh, peanuts peanuts was an introduced crop even though people now think it's indigenous it was introduced and large containers large ship loads of uh, of uh, peanuts were sent to uh, you to france for the soap industry a new industry for the soap industry and it went to places like marseille and bordeaux for a soap industry uh, now uh, with all this trade the they were not the british were not satisfied with the uh, inland transport like the the coastal transport was okay they had made also canals to help uh, some transport but the road transport to connect the coasts with the inland areas was very unsatisfactory with all the uh, you know the bullocks uh, I, i think our tindivanam road the road we are on uh, there were hundreds of bullocks plying on that road road at that time uh, but which was fine and they did a good job of it but during the monsoon for 3 months all economic activity stopped and that was not very suitable it wasn't a very favorable thing for a, a like an economy that is on the rise so they wanted to find a solution for that and the idea of the railways started coming up now for the for the railways you need a lot of steel and uh, Uh, uh the native people were very had very advanced technologies to um to produce steel from ore and uh, with very small cottage industry type of kilns they made they had small conical kilns and they got a little bit of ore and they cut a few trees and they smelted that iron ore and prepared the raw material and some of the finest uh, uh in ancient times Uh, steel ingots from south india were they went to arabia and syria and the famous syrian swords were made from south indian steel so this is a is a fact i mean people know this and all of that steel came from these small cottage industries that was like all over the place it wasn't centralized now when the idea of the railways came there was an english uh, uh, civil servant from uh, madras who wanted to invest in a larger steel manufacturing uh, setup and uh, he was supported by the east india company in every possible way and uh, they decided to start this very large steel factory in porto novo it's called the place is called parangi pete now and it is close to chidambaram it's where the river vellar uh, meets joins the sea and uh, they transported the iron ore from the selam vellar comes from the selam hills originates there that is an area rich in iron ore a very high quality iron ore they transported the iron ore in small boats and they started smelting it in very large furnaces i think the remains of that steel factory are still there and it was india's first and large st largest steel factory till then everything was small scale and village industry so to in order to uh, smelt that scale of steel you needed a lot of firewood and firewood was the fuel of the times so he was given permission to cut all the jungles in both north and south arcot to smelt the iron ore to make steel and all the steel needs for 30 years from 1830 to 1860 were met from this uh, uh, steel factory Uh, two bridges in the uk were made with that the first railway stations of madras royapuram and uh, i think maybe even egmore were also made with steel from this factory the railway tracks they need steel and you need wood not just 
to create to to make that steel but you need wood for the sleepers and i once read that in some areas they've used terracopus centralinus to make the railway sleepers so the effect of this large scale industrialization and la like relatively large uh, urban uh, development has has a very high environmental cost um then when they developed the Uh, steam locomotives the, the steam engines that was again fueled by charcoal <coughs> so you need charcoal to run that the first railway line of india not the passenger railway line but a uh, uh, goods railway line was from red hills to chintadri pet and the, these were private railway companies so that was called the red hills railroad and uh, that was the first railway line to transport stones for making the railways apart from all the trees that have to be cut for the uh, for the the track area itself so uh, it's uh, it is people have studied this i mean i'm not saying anything new people have studied this and they have said that uh, this steel uh, you know this wanton use of firewood uh, un uh, what do you say unrestricted cutting for firewood for fuel wood for the railways uh, and uh, the the production of the steel it caused immense destruction in the entire madras presidency and i have a feeling personally uh, that our area is was also probably affected by this because as the company uh, functioned uh, they started incurring a loss at by the time 1860s they were running under a loss for the simple reason there was no more firewood and they had to go very far to get it so the in 1860 60 the company closed and uh, do you guess what they did they just shifted it to another place so they shifted it to tiruvannamalai where there is low quality iron ore and that's probably the reason why uh, that hill was is so devastated you see it in the backdrop and uh, in the pictures of ramana maharshi uh, probably i'm just guessing that it might have been the reason for the destruction of the vegetation on that uh, thing and to tell you the uh, the in the same tevaram hymns uh, of tiruvannamalai it is described sambandhar describes tiruvannamalai this arunachala hill as where there is chattering waterfalls and the hill gleams like a gem so that's far from what we see much later of course now a lot of regeneration has happened and just like the oruvil area um, so the question that i asked myself is okay this was a big destruction that started in colonial times and after independence did we revert back to the values the, to the true values on which tamil civilization and culture were based did we revert back to those values or did we embrace an uh, you know economic model and an industrial system that is intrinsically exploitative that exploits nature the only thing that stopped after that first episode was that instead of exploiting resources above the ground we exploit resources under the ground so there is we exploit you know we we mine coal um, petroleum water and all of this mining activity is going to have its industrial impact its its uh, environmental impact i mean we see it all of, all over the place so i would with this i mean you know the way in which we relate to the natural environment and those ethics and that moral responsibility that uh, is you know uh, taught to us in classical literature like the kural and the sangam poetry uh, is really missing in our lives today and in fact i feel very privileged that we could uh, you know make transform this desert of oruvil into a forest and not just plant trees but like restore the entire ecological system doesn't matter that the trees do, are not as tall as before it doesn't matter but we have wildlife we have greenery you know we have fresh air and water this is the only way to proceed and i would like to end with another uh, uh, couplet of valluvar which i i like very much uh, it says it is pagatund palluir ombudal nulor toguda vatrul ellandalai am i saying it correctly more or less yes and it means to share 
coexist and protect diversity is the essence of all our hoarded wisdom.